turn this on now. Okay, is it working? Not working. Is it working now? It's not working. Okay. Tell me if it gets too loud. Um, thank you for that lovely introduction, Rebecca. Um, I feel the same way about your work. I, I bring you all welcome from New York City. <laughs> Who would have thought that um, this week when I'm coming here would be the moment when our two cities would be as affectively united and politically united as they are. Um, I do think of Ferguson as the epicenter still. I think New York has learned from Ferguson, and I do think this is a revolutionary moment. Ferguson is like Birmingham. I was thinking of it as like the role that Birmingham played in the civil rights movement as a catalyst and a model, because primarily because of the persistence of the activism around the event, because so often these events happen and there is a certain period of time in which there is activism and then it dies down. But somehow this community has had the wherewithal and the resources to maintain the level of attention to the issue. And that has been a model for the country. And uh, I really think, and, I'm, and, and in some ways, I am I'm glad, as, as horrific and as much cursing as has happened in my household over the last week, <laughs> a few days about the, the Staten Island verdict, in some ways I'm glad because it shows that it is a national issue. This is not a part of the nation um, as we thought in regard to the South or we might think about in places like Ferguson. This is a nationwide um, phenomena of uh, police murders. And the police, and you know, and the police are functionaries, right? They're means, they're, they're employees, so it's not the police. So I think what's, what's been happening over the last year because of the activism here is a sustained focus that begins to enlarge out from the police to thinking about the systemic problems. So now we're talking about <coughs> grand juries, um, but we need, to, we need to expand it even further. Um, I also want to apologize for sending my paper in so late and missing yesterday um, when they had hoped I would be able to come. I, have, I teach on late Thursday afternoons and I couldn't cancel my class yesterday because I had missed two weeks of class earlier this semester because I was on a grand jury <laughs> in Brooklyn, New York, which was a very interesting experience. In, two, in about two and a half weeks, we heard 26 cases. I am happy to report that Brooklyn grand juries are active. We asked questions. We pushed back. We did not rubber stamp all the cases that the prosecutors wanted us to rubber, to rubber stamp. But clearly what happens in a grand jury is you spend about, maybe you get maybe two hours of testimony at best for the indictments that you're asked to um, pass judgment on. I mean, it was very interesting. The other thing that I found interesting about the grand jury in Brooklyn was the Although we heard every kind of case from murder on down, we had three hate crimes, but the petty any crime that we heard in terms of property stuff, it was, um, it was pickpocketing, it was, um, it, you know, some guy was, was making facsimiles of DOT license plates that you could buy if you went to his uh, nurse's scrub store. Uh, in a certain part of Brooklyn. I want to get one of those, actually, because if you have a DOT license, but you can park anywhere you want in New York City. Well, how good is that? You know, and so he's selling these things for $200, and so this was a big crime. And then uh, there was another uh, crime of a construction site somebody had broken into and was stealing some copper pipes. If you watch The Wire, you remember Bubbles. This is a Bubbles crime, right? Bubbles was stealing the stuff. These are poor people's crimes. And you think of New York, Wall Street, the banks, right, in which 7 million homes have been foreclosed since 2008, $164 billion from black and brown communities, according to United for a Fair Economy, that was lost in 2008. The crimes in New York, and this is what we're, we're spending our attention on, it just boggles the mind. So that's why I, I, was, I was late and I've been sick. Because um, I was out on the streets last week. I, uh, I want to start with a, a personal story, too. 
from a long time ago when I was um, 21 years old, I think. I was in Atlanta, Georgia, and I was uh, at a demonstration of, with uh, students from Atlanta Junior College. And I had been in many demonstrations before. At this point, when I went to college, the Vietnam War was going on. We had constant demonstrations against the war, against the, um, for abortion rights, um, against tuition increases, a variety of things. Where I went to school at Florida State in Tallahassee, Florida, and these were all the ones I had been in before were white, minor white majority demonstrations, student demonstrations. And the police would come, and they would stand there, and they had their billy clubs, and they would take pictures, but they would just stand there, right? So when I was 21, I was in Atlanta, and I was at a demonstration connected to a struggle at Atlanta Junior College, and it was the first time I'd been in a demonstration that was majority African American. It was a peaceful demonstration, and it was a legal demonstration. And the police came, and they stood, and they took pictures, and then they charged us without warning. And they beat up, um, they, they went for the leaders, they knew who the leaders were, and they started to be, beat them up brutally with their billy clubs on their heads and on, on their genitals. And some of our leaders were um, Vietnam vets, so they had plates on their heads, right? And these guys were getting beat up. And, you know, you read about these things. I was sophisticated. I was a, I was a revolutionary at 21. I knew about these things. But to see it in front of you, to have it happen in front of you is a different experience. And I went into, like, instinct mode. I thought if I could just get the billy club out of the cop's hands, that I could, you know, save um, my, my compadre. So I, I was trying to get the billy club out of the cop's hands, and he turned on me. And um, I was six months pregnant at the time, and I think um, a, a black woman friend came in between me and, and the policeman, and I think she saved um, my son's life that day because the police was, and it was another thing I learned, it doesn't matter um, if you're six months pregnant or if you're a woman, you cannot assume that the police will not turn on you if you get in the way of what they consider their business. Um, but I, I, you know, it was a very visceral and profound lesson for me about the differences in police treatment of people in the United States. And I, I think if you haven't seen it with your own eyes, it can be hard for many people to realize that the police will come after you and will beat you senseless for doing nothing. For, for, for even when you're doing peaceful legal demonstration or for doing absolutely nothing. The next day we had another demonstration and I didn't go because of my pregnancy but my husband went and um, there was, after that demonstration, there was blood and hair all over the hallway. And again, it was, it was without provocation, without warning, um, it was a peaceful legal demonstration. And I'll tell you what we were demonstrating about because it's, it's, it's actually relevant. So the um, federal government, this is 1978, a long time ago, the federal government told the state of Georgia that they had to integrate their higher education. So they had a number of, of public institutions of higher education in Georgia. And so the state of Georgia responded to this demand to integrate higher education by putting together a plan in which they would integrate the, ma the majority black public institutions, like Atlanta Junior College and some other institutions in Georgia. Their plan didn't say anything about the University of Georgia and Athens, which was at that time 4% black in a state that was 30% black, nor did their plan say anything about Georgia State University, which is where I was a student in Atlanta which was about 14% black at that time in a city that was 60% black. So they weren't going to integrate um, University of Georgia or Georgia State, the white majority schools. They, d they were going to integrate and dismantle, in a sense, the black majority schools. And we knew from our research that the majority of African Americans who, who, who graduated with degrees, who got medical degrees, who got law degrees, and degrees of any sort, came through 
the black majority institutions of higher education in Georgia, as well as in other institutions. And this is still the case, largely in the United States. So we were, we were in some ways fighting against integration in that struggle. Uh, we were fighting to, to um, alter the plan, to have them put the focus on University of Georgia and Georgia State and take the focus away from the, uh, the historically black colleges and universities in Atlanta. So that was a, a, a moment of my political education I've never forgotten. So um, I'm going to, uh, I'm, I'm working on right now on a book on whiteness. It's called The Future of Whiteness and difficult topic. Um, it should be out next year with Polity Press. So I wanted to, to think about your topic of segregation and relationship to um, white identity in particular. I like the way you've approached this topic to complexify these terms, integration and segregation, that some people take as obvious binaries in which we obviously know what's good and what's bad. I think that's not the case. And I'm not sure that we can do a unified analysis of the politics of integration, of the politics of segregation across all domains, right, across all contexts. So um, I think, you know, I start out saying that um, segregation was in the civil rights movement and a certain narrative of the civil rights movement taken as the unquestioned opposition, the unquestioned thing that they were opposing, as Gary Peller argues. So race consciousness became a taboo. Um, integration, which was the opposite of segregation, was taken to be the goal, the moral preference, to involve colorblindness, and to bring about tolerance and humanity or harmony. And segregation was taken to signify a kind of embattled opposition, whereas integration symbolized peace and goodwill. Now, of course, the reality is, I think, that that narrative of the civil rights movement is off on a couple of points. Um, one is that it's not quite clear that integration was the unified goal. What was the goal was a set of qualitative goods that protesters wanted. They wanted quality schools without violence. They wanted access to good housing. They wanted fairness in the labor market as well as fairness at the bank loan office. There's a, you know, Hannah Arendt, the great philosopher wrote about this movement and was very critical of what she took to be African American strivers who wanted inclusion. And um, a recent book by Catherine Gines on Hannah Arendt, which is a great book I recommend, shows that Arendt was wrong. In fact, what um, the African American protesters wanted was a good education for their children more than they wanted inclusion. So the, the regulations <coughs> of apartheid enforced in public transportation and school systems were obstacles to the real goods that people wanted. And in fact, leaders regularly downplayed um, integration demands. There's another great book by Daniel McGuire, The Dark End of the of the street that talks about how civil rights leaders decided very purposefully to, to downplay in their narrative any actual integration demands for fear of eliciting ideas about the possibility of relationships. So much so that the rapes of black women by white men that was a regular part of Jim Crow life had to be set aside because the code word for races at this time was amalgamation. That was one of the, the, the words that was used to signify miscegenation or sex between the races, and no civil rights leader argued for amalgamation. So it's, it's not really clear that integration was a major end of the movement. What of today, though? I know you, in the title, Modern Segregation, I think you want to bring it up <laughs> to the present, right? Today, um, there is a renewed argument by some liberal thinkers that we need integration to reduce racism and income inequality and that segregation is the key obstacle 
um, a book by a colleague of mine in philosophy, Elizabeth Anderson, is titled The Imperative of Integration, and she marshals a lot of, of uh, evidence that integrated neighborhoods have less crime and less violence and less poverty to argue that integration is, is a necessary condition, may not be a sufficient condition, but it is a necessary condition to um, progress. And Randall Kennedy has made um, similar kinds of arguments. So I, you know, I'm not so sure. I disagree um, with this, uh, this view. So I want to complicate that a little bit here. Um, I want to give an argument that makes sense of the desire for segregation in one's choice of neighborhoods and relationships and a possible partial explanation of its persistence. Now, this argument is not meant to justify segregation, right? So I'm trying to explain it, understand it, um, understand its motivations. But um, it's not necessary. It's certainly not an argument that would justify any kind of coerced or forced segregation. Um, but I think it will complicate the picture. And then after that, I'll, I'll um, look at how the recent events here and in Staten Island um, and their concomitant examples of epistemologies of ignorance might inform and direct our analyses. Because it's a very difficult moment. The segregation of our private spaces and public spaces and public media is clearly responsible for grand jury verdicts, such as we've just seen, right? People's inability to understand um, the realities of police conduct in this country to frame um, events uh, in, in, uh, in useful and adequate ways. So segregation is clearly um, an aid to the epistemologies of ignorance that Charles Mills and others have written about in which uh, the idea of epistemology of ignorance is the idea that to be ignorant is not just to lack knowledge, but actually to perform certain epistemic practices of justification that ensure a lack of knowledge. So it's something that you do rather than something that you simply haven't done, right? So it's, it, it, it's the effort that is required to continue to believe that your society is a meritocracy, that your university is a meritocracy, that your society um, is just and moral and that poor people are poor because of their own behavior, right? It takes work to really hold on to those beliefs in the face of just the stuff that you sort of see in, in your surroundings. And so the, that's the idea of the epistemology of ignorance. And clearly, segregation is an aid to epistemologies of ignorance. So that's going to complicate my analysis in a way. I hope you'll help me think through. So um, in the past, I think whites who practiced Jim Crow were trying to separate themselves from, they, actually they weren't trying to separate themselves from non-white others because non-white others were in their homes doing domestic care work or in their lawns doing domestic care work rather, right? But the segregation was a means of enforcing social hierarchies and white supremacy. So you were on the same bus together. You were in close contact, but somebody was in front and somebody was, was behind. But it seems today that segregation practices are motivated not by the desire to enforce a certain kind of social hierarchy, but by a, a certain protectiveness, a sense of danger and threat and white vulnerability in the new climate of majority and minorities. And everybody now knows that by 2042, the United States will be a majority minority nation. Um, that's a done deal, by the way. The, uh, if you look at the one-year-olds, uh, people who, people, if there are people, who are one years old and, and, and uh, below already are um, a, a majority of those people are, are uh, non-white. So even if we change immigration tomorrow, this is not going to not happen, right? And I think this is seeping out into the hinterlands, and people now know. So there is a sense of danger and threat and white vulnerability. And 
even though by 2042 whites will become a minority, they will have um, probably several generations more of material advantage because we have lax inheritance laws and because most of our wealth is in our housing stock, right? And our housing stock has everything to do with where our neighborhood is, right? So, and that's how people put themselves through, uh, put their kids through college often. White people will take out a second mortgage, right? So it is that housing stock which is so critical and it's the housing stock that means that even after 2042, there's going to be a wealth imbalance between whites and others. Hence, um, the buying of guns. It should be obvious. I mean, I think every major issue that we're discussing today has to do with 2042. The, the immigration debates, the gun rights policy, the health care policy, all of them have to do with fears about redistributions of resources across this um, color line. So I think that this sense of protect, need for protection among whites is part of what's driving today's segregation. But what I want to suggest is it's not just the need to protect material wealth, but also a kind of psychic space. So um, I'm going to argue that social identities such as race and ethnicity are real um, and substantive. Uh, I, on my view, they're not simply top-down orchestrations or manipulations. Now, of course, that does happen, and the category Latino is a prime example of that, and I can talk about that if you're interested. There are top-down manipulations when the U.S. government decides in 1965 to name all of us by this one term based on what? Well, Hispanic was the term that they used. But they consulted the king of Spain to decide <laughs> what term to use for all these amalgamation of peoples that they thought had to be lumped together. So that stuff does happen. But I think people on the ground use identity categories because they're useful. Um, people on the ground are not simply ciphers that do what states want in all cases. So the, the identity terms that persist, that continue, that become part of people's self-description need a different explanation than simply some kind of, of ideology or, or, or manipulation. So I argue in this paper that was circulated um, that identities have, identities are politically salient because they're socially salient and that they are socially salient because they are one, explanatory, two, they are an aspect of our material existence, three, they're a feature of collective or group subjectivity, and four, they are the effect of historical experiences. So when an identity term such as whiteness fulfills these four conditions, then I think the belief we have in its existence can't be chalked up to an ideological obfuscation of reality. So I'm not going to read uh, my explanations for these four points, but I'll just give you a, a little bit of a synopsis. The idea that social identities are explanatory is an idea I take from the work of Satya Mohanty. And, the, and he, what he says is that identity terms are sort, of, are sort of like small theories that help us explain the reactions that we experience, both positive and negative, from the people around us, and that link our individual experience to larger events, to historical events. And if we think of identity terms as small theories in this way, in, that we use to, to navigate our social world, it, it's helpful because then we can begin to think of them as fallible and revisable, right? Um, we can begin to, to ask, what do they explain and what are the limits of their explanation, right? So whiteness does have explanatory value. I think the term Latino in Hispanic actually has explanatory value. But it also, there are also limits to the explanatory value that those terms have. Um, for some people have talked about, if we, if we talked about economic migration, economically motivated migration or economically motivated migrants, that's a category that interestingly would unite um, northern Europeans 
with Guatemalans and Mexicans today, right? So we're so we have to, you know, to, to think about, if we think about identities as explaining, we can begin to, to ask the question of what they explain and what they don't explain, and when we might need to uh, change, adapt, revise, even eradicate some terms as they lose their explanatory value. But I, I do believe that whiteness will retain its explanatory value well beyond 2042. Second, I argue that social identities are material practices. They're in our material, um, our atmospheres, our environments, uh, and our public culture. They're visible features of our material social spaces. They produce a kind of visual registry that organizes the interactions between us. Um, they're part of the phenomenologically accessible material world. So what I'm trying to say here is that identities are not just talk. They're also an aspect of our material environment. Um, and I think the, um, the way we take note of differences can be learned, clearly. So it's not that it is simply you know, a, a non-interpretive process to read identities off of our material environment. There's a constant um, negotiation or interpretation while, as we learn as children what to foreground and what to background and what features to pick out and focus on for specific kinds of attributes. And there's a lot of, of very good work on this. But um, the fact is that um, there, there is a materiality to identities that it's beyond, it's, it's not just a projection from the interiority of ourselves that we're projecting onto the material environment, right? It is in the material environment. And, you know, when you speak in <coughs> um, these kinds of halls, so often these beautiful, beautiful buildings and their, and their, uh, the, the <coughs> pictures, um, you, you, you get the sense of a, of a white space, a space that is honoring whites, that is, that is um, you know, privileging whites. I think we have one bridge in New York that's named after the worker who died while the bridge was being made. I think all the bridges should be named after the workers who died, because inevitably you have accidents during the building of, of skyscrapers and bridges. But what are they named after instead? No, they're named after rich benefactors and power brokers. So um, thirdly, I argue that social identities are also correlated to subjectivity, to a sense of, of the, the substance of subjectivity, including the ways we learn to perceive one another. So these patterns of perceptual attunement of what we're likely to notice, what we foreground, and what exists only in the background is some is in some measure connected to our group status. So it's not that all of what we are is group related, but some part of what makes our, us up as subjects is connected to our group identities. And this can be conflicting, right? Because we're all members of many different groups, some of which are in conflict with one another, especially those of us who are mixed, right? Can <laughs> feel like split personalities at times. But that's, that's, that doesn't take away the fact that these elements are part of subjectivity. They affect um, our interpretation of, of interactions. They affect our baseline knowledge or what we know or, or believe. This is what Sonia Sotomayor said that got her into so much trouble and almost not appointed to the Supreme Court. Um, and I use George Herbert Mead's idea that we are all born into an already existing and finely regulated system of shared meanings that organizes our self-consciousness, as he put it, from the outside in. I'll give you one other example of this. Again, a personal one. I say, when I attend baseball games with my partner, it is almost as if we are attending different events. He knows the history of the teams, the stakes of this particular game, the statistics of every player, the dispositions of the coach. He often chats away with people seated around us using a shorthand I can only guess at. 
while I, uh, his attention is riveted, while mine tends to wander. He knows where to look. I'm always <laughs> looking in the wrong place and the ball's over there. <laughs> he knows where to look and who to watch while I routinely lose the train of events. He has a skill born of a lifetime of sports imbricated with affective components based on memories of going to games with his grandfather and playing such games as a kid. My distraction and boredom is also born of a childhood in which sports knowledge was never shared. I also get aggravated by the cheerleaders' costumes and dance steps, by the macho fans screaming insults at these young kids who make, insult, who make mistakes on the field, and by the fact that such huge quantities of people are focused on men at play in a way they never focus on women. We have different perceptual attunements, baseline knowledges, foregrounds and backgrounds, and affective experiences. I like it when he provides color commentary for my benefit, explaining what he is seeing on the field, its layered meanings and significance. I enjoy entering into his world, but even so, my world never disappears from sight. I still get aggravated by the cheerleaders. Our social identities are related in obvious ways to the different experiences we have of sporting events. But the relation is complicated. Many women enjoy sports. Many men do not. I could no doubt school myself on the relevant system of meaning, so I could never replicate the rich trove of memories my partner has. My partner is also aggravated by the sexism on display in the cheerleaders' costumes and movements, though his aggravation takes the form of embarrassment, since he knows it's intended for his benefit and he wants no part of it. He's also aggravated by macho fans and the general political problems with major league sports. He well knows. But he has so many positive connections to the game that his enjoyment is not as diminished as mine. Some elements of these perceptual practices, then, can be the result of conscious choices and commitments, while others are arbitrary effects of our upbringing. So I want to, I, I think social identities need to be thought about in relationship to these kinds of experiences. They're not just labels. They are ways of being in the world. They are parts of who we are. So the, the fourth point that I raise is the point about um, history, in which, um, which the idea is that history, historical experiences, especially macro events of history like slavery, annexation of land, co colonialism, genocide, etc., cetera, um, has an effect on our affective relationships and our foreground and background choices and our judgments of new events. So identities, in some sense, are the residue of history. Danielle Allen, who's coming next week, she's terrific, characterizes these effects as history's gravity. And I think that um, this Despite the complexities of any given individual's life, this kind of genealogical connection produces in all of us a set of affective and cognitive responses to specific events, stories, and narratives that are somewhat different from others. So long story short, what I'm trying to argue in this piece is that Social categories of identity are not simply foisted on us from above, but are to some extent organically produced out of such historical events. And I use the concept of hermeneutic horizon from Hans Georg Gadamer to think about the ways in which each individual carries forward um, into new events a horizon of elements, some of which will be group related. So that horizon is constantly fluid, it's changing, and it's open-ended, right, to new events. Okay, so that's the, the gist of my argument. Let me just conclude in this last section to say that I have been arguing for some time now, and I think the events of the last two weeks should support this, that we need to stop the, the critiques of identity politics and their correlated critiques of identity. The critiques of identity politics that be emerged in the 1980s led pretty quickly in the academy to a whole series of theoretical analyses and critiques of the concept of identity itself. And there were psychoanalytic arguments given for this. There were a variety of various kinds of post-structuralist or postmodernist arguments given for these critiques of identity. 
I feel like we need to cease and desist this project and um, begin to explore identities uh, as the, you know, in this sort of organic and, and complicated way. And I, I think that um, this, this account that I'm sketching out, which very much follows, I think, and is consistent with the approach that Michael Almy and Howard Weiner and others developed years ago, um, is providing a kind of non-foundationalist situated understanding of what identities are. And the project is to come up with constructions of identity that would be resistant to the legitimate concerns about identity and the leg legitimate concerns about um, certain formations of identity politics, overly homogenizing differences within, for example, but without ceding ground to the idea that identity terms are always politically problematic or, or some kind of simple mistake. Social identities are organic, historical, essential to understanding the political flows of affect. They have epistemic salience in both a good and a bad sense, right? So they can, um, I, you know, I, I'm a Hegelian basically and to some extent. Knowledge always requires confirmation from some intersubjective activity or some public sphere. You can't know anything inside your own head without confirmation. So you can have epistemologies of ignorance confirmed in this way. You can also have it challenged and tested. But you can also have, um, you can also get a reality check as we often do, you know, after faculty meetings. Did you hear that in the same way that I did? Right? So you can, you can also get confirmation of a minoritized point of view about your society or context in this kind of process. So I think this, this substantive content of social identity sheds light on the quest for segregated spaces and the pleasures we find in them. Seeking one's own is a means of confirmation and it's a desire for relaxation. And I don't think we should demonize that impulse. And we certainly can't assume that the confirmations produced by segregation are always illegitimate or always confirming bad beliefs. Um, segregation today is quite different than in the Jim Crow era. It's not always enforced by the state. Sometimes it is the result of, of voluntary or volitional actions or choices to some extent. But it continues to carry a high cost. The absence of an integrated public sphere means that disagreements about the grand jury verdicts in Ferguson and Staten Island are unlikely to be, to be resolved in any productive dialogue. Where exactly would that take place? One of the things that Nell Painter argues in her The History of White People is that um, whiteness is today not always as normative or as positive an identity as it used to be, right? Um, it's no longer so easy for whites themselves to see whiteness as simply the singular norm or the default position. And that that's the result of not, it's not just sort of living alongside non-white others because that happened throughout um, the entirety of our history. But it is having the presence of non-white subjectivity in the form of cultural expressions in the public sphere in which you realize that the way you might be viewing Ferguson is not the way everybody views Ferguson. In fact, it's not the way even every lawyer views Ferguson, right, if you have your epistemic hierarchies in place of who, who you're likely to believe. So there is this um, feeling of uncertainty about the meaning of whiteness, the value of whiteness, the political valence of whiteness for many white people. And it is becoming increasingly difficult for whites to find spaces in which they will only get confirmation because even if they go into a gated community, you turn on the television or the radio and you're going to hear a different point of view. So um, I think it takes much more effort today than it used to and whites find themselves the object of a new gaze that foregrounds their whiteness in ways that are not always flattering. This creates new motivations and they're harder and harder to, to find. North Carolina and Kansas are two states that have experienced so much Latino migration that they're shifting from red to blue. Um, and the other trend line, the last thing I want to point out is that 
the other trend line that's important to grapple with are the growing political disparities among whites themselves. Today, perhaps more than ever, whiteness has a variegated relationship to avowed racism. About half of whites consistently in research surveys um, agree, about half of whites agree with most people of color on many issues related to race. Not all issues, but many issues related to race, including the claim that anti-black racism is still a large problem, that racism infects the criminal justice system, that immigrants are treated unfairly. And um, the, the, uh, I don't think there's really good statistics that have come out in, in the, the last two weeks on white reactions to Ferguson and, and Staten Island. It's still early days yet. But the ones that are coming out are foregrounding the differences between white and African American in particular um, views. And there are. There's like a 20-point a gap in some cases. But here's what I want to um, remind people of alongside that information. Only, according to Pew Research Center data recent, only 48% of whites believe that a lot of progress has been made on racism. That leaves 52% who believe either that little progress has been made or no progress has been made. 35% of whites have a great deal of confidence in the police. And this is just a very recent survey. There's more than a 20-point gap in this percentage than for black Americans, but the interesting point remains that 65% of whites disagreed with the claim that they have a great deal of confidence in the police. In fact, only 36% of whites say they have a great deal of confidence that police officers in their community, in their community, will not use excessive force on suspects. So I think we focus too often on the gap between white and black and brown and miss the growing gap among whites. The nation is increasingly politically polarized on a number of critical issues from guns to health care, and it's that polarization that's mainly due um, to the polarization occurring among whites themselves, right? So it's that when we talk about the, the national polarization, it's not really a polarization within communities of color. It's a polarization among whites that's determining that trend. So that means that when racist whites want to find a segregated space in which their views can be given support, they need more than white-only spaces, or they may find challenges similar to those they would face elsewhere. So what I hope to have shown is that ident the identities that motivate segregation are real formations of perceptual attunements and historical experiences that reflect material realities. The stakes of segregation are real and really high. Clearly, though, we, m we need a more integrated public sphere, a sphere of the commons that's not white dominant. The country as a whole right now reflects Ferguson and Staten Island, communities whose demographics are not represented in the elite structures of power in the media and the government or any major institution in their local spaces or in their national spaces. This is what has to change. Thanks very much.